Being a ministry wife is a vocation without a job description. And let's be honest, sometimes it seems like ministry might be easier if we did have one. If you are a ministry wife like me and are looking for hope, perspective, and a little bit of practical advice regarding your role, you're in the right place. I'm Christine Hoover. Welcome to the Ministry Wives Podcast, a production of the North American Mission Board. Join me as we hear from women from various ministry contexts, having authentic conversations about our shared joys and challenges, even the ones we're unsure we can talk about. No topic is off limits. My guests today are Greg and Kelly Mott. Greg serves as the pastor of Houston's First Baptist Church. I love the Motts so much, and you're going to love them too when you finish listening to their wise advice about creating healthy rhythms of rest and renewal as individuals, as a couple, and for their family. We talk about Sabbath rest, turning off ministry at the end of the day, and a little bit about sabbaticals. So there's lots of good stuff here. This episode is actually a throwback episode from my previous podcast, By Faith. I wanted to share this interview with you today because it was one of my favorites in a year-long series I did previously on vocational ministry. And it also serves as an opportunity for me to tell you that if you're resonating with what we're doing here on Ministry Wives, there are seasons and seasons of episodes available in this very feed that you are welcome and invited to explore. With that, friends, here is my interview with Greg and Kelly Mott. I'm super excited to welcome my friends, Greg and Kelly Mott, to By Faith. Welcome, you guys. Thanks. We're glad to be on with you. Yes, for sure. When I think of y'all, I think of Team Mott. That's how you call your, that's what you call yourselves. That's right. Where did yeah. that come from? Where, when did y'all start saying that? Well, I had a friend and he called his, his family Team Reader. Their last name was Reader. And I just thought, man, that is awesome. And so we just started calling ourselves Team Mott to just build that teammate aspect and then something kind of funny we would hug and we'd, we'd get together and hug and I'd say stable secure family no need for drugs or gangs team Mott <laughs> you know and so <laughs> that, was our, that was our little deal and then I started saying it in church and then now it's been fun all over our church people call whatever their family is team you know whatever and so it's really caught on in a great way. So just, I heard it from a friend, we took it for our family and then now our whole church is team such and such, so. I love it. Well, to introduce, for those who don't know you, tell us about Team Mott. Okay, so I'm Kelly and um, Greg and I have been married for 25 years this summer. Wow. So I'm really just married to my best friend and so, so grateful for, for Greg and our marriage. Uh, we have two kids. Our son Grayson is 20 and a sophomore at Texas A&M University. And we have a daughter, Valerie, who's 14 and an eighth grader going into high school next year. So mm-hmm. that's that's us. We're just thankful for them. Yeah, I Greg will tell you a little bit more ministry context though. Yeah. And then I'm the pastor at Houston's First Baptist. I've been here about 18 years. Um, Before that, I was the leader of Breakaway Ministries, which, you know, that's where we we connected way back in the day at Texas A&M. And so that started my partner with about 12 people. And then now 33 years later, it's still going with thousands in the basketball stadium. So I was there and had a great time um, doing that, which was awesome. Uh, and then I would travel when I was doing those days, speaking and doing doing stuff like that, which we'll we'll mention in a little bit too on one of uh, the things that we'll talk about. And so I feel like for those listening, I've I've kind of got two worlds. I know the existing church. Our church started in 1841. Um, we still got some original members, you know. Um, so, <laughs> No, they're not quite that. <laughs> we do got, we got all ages. Um, so we got that and then had the entrepreneurial side of breakaway, you know, which would be kind of that church plant, start a ministry, you know, just you're, you're praying. Remember when we got a copier, I thought we were like big time because we had a copy machine back in the day, you know, and now here at Houston's first with we're multi-site, we have four campuses and, all sorts of things going on. So I've got, I've got both sides of um, the ministry spectrum of something starting in my apartment to taking over something that's, you know, 170 something years old now. So, um, so, and it's been a blessing. What a ride, what a journey. We're grateful to God. So, yes. Well, I'm personally so thankful for y'all. And as Greg mentioned, I've known you guys for a long time. Kelly and I were in school together 
at a and and knew each other through a mutual friend. And then y'all got married and I was attending breakaway. So I don't know if any, if y'all caught that, but the Bible study that started in Greg's apartment now meets in the basketball arena at Texas A&M, meaning thousands of Aggies are attending every week. And that's been going on, you said, 33 years. I mean, and I was a part of that as a student and it continues to this day. And it's just amazing, an amazing ministry. Uh, but when I think about y'all, I think of two stories. And the first story is when I was a senior in college, I, my friends and I moved into a house in a neighborhood down the street from y'all. And it was kind of far from campus. I don't know how we ended up getting into this place, but there were no students around. And we just plopped ourselves in this little rental house and we never mowed the yard. <laughs> and one day we came home. I mean, it was a jungle and we came home and our, our, our lawn had been mowed and it was Greg Mott who had come down the street with his mower and mowed the lawn for us. And that probably is the only time it got mowed that whole year, Greg. So thank you for doing that. The second story is about Kelly. So I think it was that same house. I moved away from College Station, got married. We moved back to College Station and we had our little babies, you, Grayson and my oldest. And I remember coming over to your house one day for lunch. And before we ate, you said, let's pray. And we, and you prayed such a deep prayer regarding our husbands and ministry and their day and, and praying for their integrity, praying for their that the spirit would use them, that he would give them wisdom. And I just learned so much in that moment about praying for my husband. That story actually shows up in my book because I thought I'm not praying like that for my husband. And I learned so much. I learned a lot of things from you, Kelly, but that sticks out to me. Those two stories describe you two to a T servant hearted, prayerful, just so gracious and kind. So I just wanted to say that to everybody, but one of the, one of the things that y'all really influenced Kyle and me in terms of pastoral ministry is rest. And, you know, I think some can, what comes with that is setting boundaries and setting some parameters around, um, life so that we can have healthy rhythms. And so I would love to, to just learn from y'all today. Let my listeners learn from you. How do you two work together as a couple to protect healthy rhythms of rest and renewal in your life there in Houston? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's such a good question. First, I just want to say how grateful I am truly for Greg, um, for his spiritual leadership and um, for prioritizing rest through the years, because it really has been such a blessing to our family and just a blessing to be able to follow his lead in that area. So, so, so grateful for him um, for so many reasons, but for sure for his spiritual leadership and prioritizing rest. Um, I think we've really grown through the years of understanding and respecting one another's different needs for rest um, in a lot of ways and um, just getting to where we um, just appreciate one another and understand one another, respect one another. We have said through the years, I think Greg could live life in gear six. I can live it in gear four. And so we come together and live life in gear five is really what happens. And so I think both of us hopefully help each other become, um, you know, just a healthier person. The two become one, but just this, this, you know, finding that place. So I think, you know, just considering each other, communicating a lot, you know, about what's coming up and what each other's needs are, that type of thing, considering the calendar, continue to others' needs, and then just also the calendar. I think um, something that I've learned that nothing is something when I look at the calendar. Um, sometimes it is, sometimes nothing's nothing, and it needs to be filled with something, but sometimes nothing is something, and it doesn't need to be filled with something, so it can say nothing, and that is something. <laughs> Does that make sense? That is so, great. Um, yeah, so just um, I think we've come to learn that together and really um, protecting that together and understanding the need for that. Mm-hmm. That's good. I think, too, on the building off what Kelly says about understanding each other, you know, you understand yourself best because you're with yourself all the time. So you begin to assume that everybody's like you. So if there's one person in the ministry marriage, that's very driven and one that's maybe a little bit more calm and restful, the driven one's like, come on, let's go. We got to do this. And then the, the calm one is like, why do we, why do we need to do this again? We already did this, you know? And so it's, it's kind of a thing. So I, I have learned a lot from Kelly as well where I would see our house as a place to shower, change clothes to, and then go do life. She saw it, saw it as a place that that's where life was and everything else was kind of the other. 
And so I had to learn that, and especially in parenting, that was really great for me to learn because it, it got us home. And that was really great. And so I was, I'm kind of more the achiever. Uh, she's more the, the build the nest. And, and so I had to realize I can't just be taking her everywhere to make, just keep this thing going. I've got to be able to rest and to come back. So we, I think we've learned a lot from each other is, is the key on how to work together where I'm not pushing her um, and she's not holding me um, back kind of thing. And we've kind of learned how to do that together. And, and that's been a, been a great thing. And then truthfully, I think I've, I've profited the most by learning how to rest because most, well, I don't want to say most, uh, some or a lot of, I mean, maybe most, I don't know, of my drive was from dysfunction. You know, it was from need of approval, need of success, you know, wanting to do all that. And so when you learn to rest, that shifts that drive from being based in dysfunction to being based in abiding that then begins to be achieving, you know, apart from me, you can do nothing, John 15. So I want to abide and then let my abiding bring my achieving. Mm -hmm. I had it reversed. My achieving was bringing my worth, you know, and then if I, I'd abide, if I get to it, you know, or rest in the Lord later on. So we've learned a lot from each other and that's, that's made us work together and trust each other. That is so good. And I would love to ask each of you a follow-up question. Greg, for you, how did you learn that? Because I imagine you learned it the hard way that something you came to a realization that you were looking to achieve in order to get, get that approval. So how did you, how did you attack that when you realized that's, that's what's happening? How did you choose to abide versus achieve? Yeah, I think two things. Um, one, I, I've been under such great teaching my whole life, you know, at least as a believer. I just look back at the pastors I've had, the people I've been around, the, the things I've getting, gotten to go to as far as conferences. And, and I just look back and go, man, what amazing teaching. Now, will I give that application to the teaching? So I think there's a part of my rest that actually came very easy and not the hard way because I kept hearing people talk about it. And I went, well, I need to do that. Oh, I guess this thing of Sabbath's real. I guess this don't be overbooked, you know, kind of thing is real. So that was the easy way. And that's, that's, a, I do give credit to that and, and find that to be true. The hard way I would say is, you know, in ministry, you kind of, it's interesting, you find what you're good at and then you get some attention for it. So, you know, I'm not the star quarterback I'm not going to be the, the big hunt and fishing guy. And I appreciate all those things, but I can speak, I can lead, I can maybe jot down a thought or two. And I started getting attention for that. So what we do as humans is we gravitate for the places in which we get, get applause and my vocation in ministry, especially with breakaway launching like a rocket, I began to get a lot of attention for that. And I had to go back and say, okay, wait a minute. I cannot be, I remember this distinct thought. I'm not as, my worth is not based on how well my last talk went. And that's what I felt like. So if the talk went great, man, I felt, yeah, yeah, didn't feel so good. You know, didn't go so good. Then not so, not so good. And I thought this is a, this is a dangerous loop to get into, um, to every seven days decide if I'm worthwhile, <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's not going to work. So you just have to pull out and go, you know, some, some messages in my realm, some of them are going to be a double, some are going to be a triple, some are going to be a home run. You know, hopefully it's not a total strikeout. If you teach the Bible, you know, I mean, you know, his word never returns void. Mm -hmm. So you always got a single. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and, and, you know, maybe even home run, I don't want to negate, <laughs> you know, equate the word of God on how good my illustration was. That's not what I'm saying, but, but anyway, so easy under great teaching, take the application of the things you've heard, even maybe a, God uses this podcast in someone's life. And then two, um, you know, just take yourself out of the trap, take it out of that, that death spiral, you know, of, of doing all those things. Mm -hmm. well, Kelly, my question for you is I know a lot of women listening who are similar to, to the personality that you, you guys described where the husband is very go-getter and the wife feels sometimes like she's riding a fast moving train and isn't sure that she can keep up. Right. And so I'd love for you to speak to women who are in, they have a similar personality as you, where you like to be at home and, and knowing you, that's a huge gift and blessing 
that you bring to people is your subtle, you are a settled soul and your home reflects that. So how have you learned to embrace that? And what would you say to women who feel a little bit overwhelmed at their husband's adventurous nature? Mm, That's a good question. I think um, I have learned that the more Greg has on his plate, the less I need to have on mine. And so that balances out and I'm okay with that. You know, it's not that I can't have other involvements. I can't have other things, you know, going on outside of that. But I just know in order to keep up, <laughs> I realize that that's a, that's a calling in and of itself. You know, I don't need a lot outside of that to, um, to have much on my own plate because a lot of what is on his plate is going to include me, right? Mm-hmm. Um, some, some does, some doesn't, but it's in a lot of ways it does. And so I realized that his plate kind of overflows onto my plate. <laughs> and so that's a lot right there. And so um, anyway, so I think just finding peace in the balance and being okay with that, you know, having those, um, I think, like I said, over time, we've kind of come to the middle and find this healthy healthier place to live um, where we both kind of complement one another. But I think just maybe just a- acknowledging that, realizing that that is a lot in of itself and to not have to add to that can sometimes kind of lessen the load. Mm-hmm. That's good. It's like you're saying you don't have to match his in- intensity, right. but you can, you can be um, almost like a, a, the word buffer comes to mind. I don't know if that's the right word, but you can compliment him is what you said. You don't have to match it, but you can help him by bringing your personality to the mix. So that's really good. So we're talking about rest and I'd love to hear from y'all how you, what does rest look like for you as individuals, as a couple, as a family, like what, can you kind of give us an insight into how y'all do that? Yeah. Um, I, I'll, I'll start with this one. I, I heard this from our pastor when you and I went to the same church way back in College Station back in the day. And um, he said, give your mornings to God, give your afternoons to the church and give, give your evenings to your family. And that's been always a really good template. And oftentimes what I think pastors do is they give their mornings to the church, they give their afternoons to the church, they give their evenings to the church, and then they got to figure out how to get a message on Saturday night right? Because everybody's been calling. So I, I really section off my days. My mornings are for the Lord. Now that doesn't mean having a quiet time. Uh, I mean, I, I definitely do that as well, but get to the office. That's preparation. That's whatever I want to do. So from, from, you know, eight to 11, I don't do any, I don't have any other meetings besides what I want to do. And then I get the big rocks in the jar, um, so to speak, which is, which is really great. And to get that, um, get that really solid. Now here's something I did with my mornings it was a game changer for me on rest. I would, you know, little kids at home, I would have my mornings, I'd prepare meetings for church in the afternoon, you know, get home and there's still some church stuff going on, you know, when you get home at times. Uh, but, and then the kids were just going for it, you know, little league practice. I mean, it's, it's chaos in a good way, but it's just active is what I should say, not chaos. So it's very active. And then I would be like, you know, I'm an only child from a, you know, my mom and dad were divorced when I was two. So I spent, live with my mom, saw my dad on the weekends. So I'm used to quiet solitude and I would get home and want that. And it doesn't exist with little kids. So I rearranged my mind that my mornings with God of preparation were also my times of solitude and rest and Mm -hmm. and renewal. And I was like, I just hit me. I'm like, I have three hours a day by myself Mm -hmm. and I get to have a cup of coffee. I can put on nice slow piece place paced music I can have a journal, I can pray. Now, yes, it's talk-based, most of it, my message-based, but it's also can be refilling for that individual time that I'm not gonna get any other place. Mm. So those are a little bit of, of what I do. Now, one, one little, one other thing to add, um, and I would really encourage this is I have a day every month, I've done this for years since the breakaway days, I call it time with the father. So on my schedule, you'll see a Thursday and I'll say TWF once a month. And my, my assistant knows it. Kelly knows it. I know it every month. And I get away, go somewhere else besides the church. And, and I, you know, spend time. Now, here's the phrase, working on the ministry, not in the ministry. And so many folks are always working in the ministry. They're never working on the ministry. So visions, whatever they thought of before the meeting, you know, you got to work on the ministry. So look at all my messages coming up. Look at all the things that have happened, pray through things. I fast. Uh, Sometimes I feast and I just spend time reading, doing whatever I want. And that has been a lifesaver 
uh, for me as well. So those, those are some things. I try to give you the daily, mornings, afternoons, evenings, give you a monthly with time with the father, and then we have a yearly uh, study sabbatical that I do. So, so that gives me a rhythm of working all these things out of rest instead of crash and burn, crash and burn, crash and burn. You know, oh, I'm so tired, I gotta take a day off. Oh, I'm so tired, I need a nap. I'm not just grabbing it on the run, I've systematized it. And everybody at church knows it. Here's the thing that pastors don't believe. The church applauds it. They applaud it. They love when their pastor spends a day with God um, and they applaud it. And so that's that's a great thing to be able to, to see that happening like that. That's good. What about you, Kelly? Well, I would say um, just to talk about as a couple, um, we have Fridays, Greg, Friday is Greg's day off. And so that's just been so good for us personally, individually, and just as a couple to just have that day. It's come to be our favorite day of the week. It's just like this computer reset button each week, you know, and um, just truly his Sabbath, right? Because Sunday he's working all day. And so we get the, you know, Friday and Saturday weekend thing. And so um, that's just wonderful. You know, we, we always work out together in the morning. That's kind of um, on the schedule every, we go um, and do that. And, um, you know, just have extended quiet times, get to go outside, get in God's creation, just enjoy being together and resting. We usually eat out um, at least one meal that day. And so um, that's just a blessing. And I think as a family, when we come together and rest, what that looks like. Um, one thing I love is to um, be able, what's really restful for me is be able to wake up without an alarm. <laughs> just to have a day a week where you can wake up without the alarm is just a blessing. And um, just have extended time in the word. Um, you know, we uh, love to journal, all of us, um, and just, you know, gratitude journals and prayer and worship and just being out in God's creation, having good food, good fellowship, just having, having physical activity, um, you know, just the physical and the emotional, the mental, spiritual, all of that, just trying to refresh in those ways has just really been a blessing. And so, yeah, so I think, you know, it looks different from season to season, you know, when, when the kids were little, um, I really tried to rest when they rested you know, they take a lot of naps when they're little. In some ways, kids are really active, right, and kind of keep you going, but in some ways, they're kind of a governor, too, on your rest, because I remember when they took two naps a day for a good length of time, and then they moved to that one long afternoon nap, and I really tried to, you know, utilize that time, and if they were down, I'd kind of go down, you know, maybe not for the whole time, but really try to rest when they rested, and it actually was a governor, and in some ways, you know, every season, right, is pros and cons, and, you know, and challenges, and, and blessings, and all of that, but in some ways it gets easier, some ways it gets harder, right? But um, but I think as they, you know, as those naps went away, that got a little more challenging because they were actually a governor to me when the kids were little and could rest because I rested when they rested. So anyway, so it looks a little different from season to season, but, um, but it's also neat when they get older and they can kind of linger with you um, at the table for dinners and they enjoy resting too. So that's so that's good. What that looks like. Well, Greg, I want to go back to what you just said about churches really valuing their pastor, taking times of rest, because I think a lot of times we believe the opposite as, as church leaders, we think, or maybe it's not even what we think other people think, but we struggle to turn off. And I hear this from a lot uh, of women saying their husbands really struggle to turn ministry off. They come home, but they're distracted because they're thinking about the, what's worrying them about the ministry. And so how would you counsel a, a leader? And that could be a pastor like you, it could be a pastor's wife to, to take that first step toward, I'm going to turn distractions off and I'm going to choose intentionally choose some of the rhythms that you've, de you've described. I would encourage first, if I could back up one notch and, and give the right perspective. Okay the perspective that oftentimes people incorrectly have is ministry is causing this. Okay. Now it's not ministry that's causing this. It's responsibility. That's causing it. Ministry is a job with responsibility. And if we don't realize that what we'll do is we'll blame ministry and ultimately we'll blame God. And that's, that's a bad connection. If I can blame responsibility then I can realize, you know, the president of the bank, he's having trouble turning it off too. The car dealer guy is having trouble turning it off too. There's stress for the business owner. Uh, there's stress for, for the investment person. There's, I mean, stress for the principal. There's a lot of people. And sometimes I think we can kind of turn into this woe is me with ministry, you know, when really our job is other people's vacations, you know, what they do on their off time includes us. And so that's a blessing. 
and we were going to go to church anyway. Now we get paid for it, you know, so that works out good. Um, but to be able to see that it's a job res with responsibility. Now I can talk to my kids about that, my wife about that, instead of blaming it all on ministry, which is directly connected with God. So I have a job with responsibility. How your husband has a job with responsibility. It's a lot of responsibility. And so when I get home, I've got momentum that's continuing to go. And two things that I've got to do to stop that momentum, I've got to disconnect and I've got to distract, okay? Disconnect is I have to not have a cell phone call. And I do this, unfortunately, terribly so, on the way home because I need that disconnect. Um, I don't know how many times my kids have been in the yard and my car is five houses down as I'm finishing up a call. Well, I should have never called the guy in the first place right? Or I shouldn't have never answered it in the first place. So that disconnect, put your phone up. And if you can be there from about six to nine, full on with your family, you can do whatever you want after nine, because they're all going to sleep, you know, the, at least kids wise, or the, if they're students are going to be doing homework. So the, the disconnect. And then second, the distract, what can you do instead of um, the, the things of ministry, go for a run, go for a walk, walk the dog, um, watch the news if that's what you're into, uh, you know, change clothes, talk to somebody, put all the screens down. But if, if you walk in the house and everybody else is on a screen, we're well, just going to stay doing your thing. And, and it's just never going to end. So if there's no disconnection, there's no distraction. I use distraction as a positive word. Um, then you're going to continue in the momentum of the day. I've been running 65 miles an hour all day long. You're not just going to shut it off when you walk in the house. So you've got to have that, that line and realize, okay, responsibility is stressful. If I just want to, you know, hourly wage job, you know, doing whatever, I don't want to give an example because I'm sure there's very high responsibility in hourly wage jobs too, but I, then that's the deal. But I don't, I want a job with responsibility. And this is one of the challenges of having a job with responsibility. And it happens to be ministry. So I'm going to blame responsibility, not blame God for putting me in ministry. And that's where you end up with that spiritual burnout where people at the end of their ministry, they don't like their Christianity, you know? And I tell our staff all the time, don't let your ministry ruin your Christianity. You know, you walk with God and let that be a part of your heart and your life. That is so good. So good. Are there other things that you could think of that kind of have fueled overwork or that you hear, you know, pastors say, or that you've thought yourself that fuel this overwork. Yeah. I was at a conference or some, I can't remember totally where it was a lunch or a conference or something. And this guy said it was a lunch with other pastors in town. That's what it was. And this pastor said, he talked to a guy and the guy said, I can tell you what I can, I have a phrase that I can get any pastor to do what I want them to do by this one phrase. And so we're all like, wow, what is it? What's this, this phrase? And it's kind of a little scary. And he said, here's all I have to say. I'm so disappointed in you. And if I can somehow create the feeling that I'll be disappointed in you or the church will be disappointed in you, I can get you to any function. I can get you to do anything. I can get you to stop change or start change by just that. And that, that is, that's really true in a lot of it ways. It is true. Pastor and a shepherd are the same thing. That's what we're to be, a minister and a shepherd. And so we love the sheep. And when they get their claws, especially if you've got that, that church member that can manipulate and maybe don't even know they're doing it, and they get their claws in on you're going to disappoint them or you're going to fail or you're not going to do what they expected or do it to the quality that they thought it should be, boy, they can run you ragged. Um, and you'll just, you're just chasing your tail for 20 years. Oh, that is so true. So how do you personally, Greg Mott, fight that when you sense sent someone's disappointment? How do you, how do you respond mentally? I tell, I tell them to go to a different church. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I just, I just, I, I, you have to delegate it. You know, you have to, to say, we're not going to be able to do that. Or you have to tell them why you can't do that. You know, why is a good thing. You don't have to say it defensively, but man, you know, I got, you know, we get invited to do all sorts of stuff and we already had something, man, I wish I could be there. I can't, you know, and just to be able to, to say that. And, and the something else can be family, 
Um, it doesn't have to be, and you're not lying. You really do have something else to do. And so, so that's the way you do it. And you just, you just have to have a little bit thicker skin too. And I'd, I'd rather hug you than hit you, you know, the kind of pastor I am. I, I want people to, to like me, to connect with me. I want all that. That's a great thing. So I just had to develop a little bit thicker skin as well and just say, you know, I'm sorry. And, you know, you find with people that are like that, there's a lot of times awake behind them. They do this. They're, they're kind of a problem in a lot of places. And the problem is really not you. It's just, it's, it's probably them but you just have to be sweet and kind and just not receive it. Yeah. We don't have to receive everything people are given, you know? And so deflect it with the shield of faith, you know, the breastplate of righteousness. And you can feel when that arrow gets into your heart, that flaming yeah. dart to, to deflect it and let it, let it be. So, um, so that's, that's how I'd answer that. That's good. Well, Kelly, I want to turn to you because as I've said already, you're just really good at creating environments that are peaceful and I can see how God has put you with Greg for you to compliment one another, because I could see, I can see that you are really good at creating uh, peace for your family and for, for you as a couple. And so I would love for you to just share about that. How do you go about creating an environment that, that allows for rest for you and Greg and your kids? Mm-hmm. It's definitely my desire for sure. Um, I think it starts with my heart. Um, honestly, I think about Colossians 3.15. I love that verse. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And I love that. And so I think creating a peaceful environment starts with becoming a peaceful person. And, um, you know, the more peaceful we are, right, the more we'll create an environment around us that's conducive to rest. And I acknowledge, I realize that that's not always easy, right? I mean, sometimes it takes some wrestling with the Lord to get to a place where, um, where the peace of Christ is actually ruling our hearts, you know, and that might even require professional counseling in certain seasons of life, you know, depending on where we are. And so, and that's okay. But um, when we let God do a deep work in us, then he can do it through us, right? His peace fills our hearts and then it overflows um, into our homes. So I think I would just say internal first, you know, take care of the internal first and then the external things will, will take care of itself. And then, then it's just a joy at that point, right? Then it becomes a joy. Like, what do you, what do you enjoy doing? You know, I love cooking and baking for the family. I love, I definitely love lighting candles and putting on a cozy fire and, you know, being available for meaningful conversations to have that extended time, you know, in God's word and prayer and journaling and, and all of those things. Um, and just at being out in God's creation, all those things. I just think, you know, those, those external things start becoming, you know, um, a joy to create and, and provide um, from the overflow of a heart that's deeply at peace. And I think, so I think it starts there. I really see creating this sacred space as a calling um, because I, I know that rest is a command and I know that that requires boundaries. It requires time. It requires sacrifice, um, humility, wisdom, obedience, and, but I know that God makes it worth it. And I would even say God himself is worth it, right, um, for that. And so um, I've just found that making room for rest is deeply rewarding. And um, I already mentioned the calendar thing, you know, seeing nothing as something and realizing that saying no uh, is really a yes to something else. It's always a yes to something else, you know, and, and in many cases, it can be a yes to rest you know, um, and just realizing that, you know, and, and I think saying no sometimes to, in order to have this type of place in this environment, it can, um, people maybe struggle with saying no for different reasons and saying, um, you know, it might be um, FOMO, right? Fear of missing out on something, right? Um, whether it's an actual event or if it's someone's approval, like Greg mentioned or something. Um, I don't really necessarily have FOMO, but I do have FORO, <laughs> which is um, fear of running out, you know? So, oh. God has to kind of challenge me to, you know, um, you know, to know when to say yes, when to say no, right? I can kind of um, sometimes not say yes when I need to say, you know, or not, or say no when I need to say yes and vice versa. So anyway, but just, I guess, I think it just starts with my heart, right? And just taking care of that internal peace and then letting that overflow into the home to create an environment that's conducive to peace. Mm -hmm. So that's so good. Well, I'd love to ask a pastor's wife recently asked me, 
and so I'm passing the question on to you, Kelly, <laughs> that we're, we're kind of sometimes told two messages as pastor's wives. One is we want to create a safe haven for our husbands. We want him to come home and it be a refuge. And, and we really genuinely want that for him. But then also there are some times where we need something. We, we need to apply pressure, so to speak, on our husband, meaning something we see a blind spot or, you know, there's, there's a hurt that needs to be addressed. And so we can sometimes feel this tension of when do I need to speak up in a way that I know is going to cause him to feel the opposite of peace, but it's for, a, it's, you know, c- God is compelling me toward that. And, and how do I know when I need to kind of wait and maybe not say something because he needs it to be peaceful. Hopefully that makes sense, but Totally, it totally makes sense. Um, I the two words come to mind: um, timing and tone. So timing and tone. I think timing um, is so important. I can tell you when it's not the right time, <laughs> for sure. Um, before I can even tell you what the right time, I can tell you it's not right when they, right when they walk in the door after a long day of work. That's not the right time, right, to bring it up. It's not right after they've preached or poured it out in some significant way, right? You, that's it's not the time. They're empty and that's not the time to do it. It's not late at night when you're both like super tired and exhausted after a long day, you know, that's definitely not in. And it might just be as simply as simple as asking, asking when is a good time, you know, just acknowledging that we need to have a serious conversation, need to have a difficult conversation, something I need, we need to talk about and when would be a good time and just let him in. Ask, answer that, you know, and let him find that time and then then determine when it is and then d- decide and then then go for it. And then so timing is so important when the best timing is for you. And then and then tone. I think tone is so important. I love Proverbs 15, verse one. that says a kind word turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So our tone is so important. We can have difficult conversations. In fact, we, we often need to. Um, we can have challenging ones. We can have serious ones, but but we can do it in with a respectful tone, we can do it with a respectful heart. And so I think the tone is so important. And Proverbs, in Proverbs, it actually says it twice in 21, nine and in 25, four, it says better to live in the, in the corner of the housetop than in a house with a quarrelsome wife, right? So, I mean, they'd rather live in the attic by themselves than with, you know, in a, in a pretty put together house with a wife that's nagging or, you know, just, you know, doesn't have the right tone. And so I think, and again, that kind of goes back to the heart, you know, Lord, you know, and I have, we may have to wrestle some things out before that peace of Christ rules in our heart in order to have those more difficult conversations. But I think it's, um, they can be had They're absolutely, and they need to be had. Um, but I think timing and tone is probably the most important part um, to preface them with. That's very helpful. Well, y'all mentioned a part of your rhythm is a sabbatical. And this is something that Kyle and I have really picked up from you guys of how to do a sabbatical. So I want to spend the rest of the time just talking about sabbaticals. And let's start with just why. Why do pastors and their families need to take sabbaticals? I would say because of the emotional wear and tear that happens as a pastor. Um, you're you're pouring out emotionally, spiritually, physically. I I mean, I'm tired at the end of the day, but I, I couldn't tell you the last time I lifted anything, you know, or really had some physical labor going on, you know, I mean, I'm, that's, that's not my role, but emotional, spiritual, there's, you know, just, just this week, I've been in contact with a family that's son, unfortunately committed suicide with two men whose wives are dying. Um, I mean, this, that's just, that's a normal week for pastors. You know, I mean, maybe not the the suicide part, but but that pastoral care part is what I'm trying to say. So there's an emotional um, aspect that that comes from that. And so I think that's the why is you need to be refilled and emotions take more than eight hours to refill. Your physical body can refill a good night's rest or a couple nights rest, but it's going to take a lot longer to really come down. Um, And then I think secondly, it puts it in a place where um, unpredictability is very low. As a pastor, you don't know what is about to happen. You're walking the hall, somebody goes, can I ask you a question? You're like, oh, great. (laughs) What is about to happen here? You know, but you get away on sabbatical and you're, you know, off away from the church. You, You start seeing time blocks in morning, afternoon, and evening, instead of I got an eight o'clock appointment, a 9.30 appointment, an 11.30 lunch, and you know, your time blocks are hours. Instead, they move into chunks of the day. 
and that replenishes you. So that's that's what I would say the why is. And then, then well, and one other, if I could add, is you begin to work on the ministry, not in the ministry, like I said before. And now you really come up with what are we going to do? What's the plan? What's the vision? Um, and how are we going to implement this? And really having those times to be able to, to let that be a, a mm-hmm. way of letting that blossom. Can you all describe how you practice this? What does it look like when you take a sabbatical? Well, again, it's looked different from season to season, right? But um, for the most part, we, you know, have four, he gets four Sundays off in a row. And so we have four weeks together. And usually, you know, it depends on what's happening at the time. But for the most part, he would spend those mornings away from, you know, just by himself or, you know, um, with the Lord, maybe, maybe if he's writing a book for that time, or if he's not, you know, different things, but, um, and then we would all come back together for lunch in the afternoon playing, you know, that kind of thing. So we would just kind of organize it depending on the needs at the time, but usually there's a, a portion of the day where he's by himself. And then the other time that we're, we're together as a family and we just kind of like this, it's like an, ex, like an extended Sabbath, you know, I mean, it really is. It's time in God's creation. It's time in God's words. It's time, you know, together as a family, fellowshipping, that type of thing, sometimes fasting, sometimes feasting, but it's just extended time together with the Lord and each other. I'd say too, when you, if you go on a sabbatical, you have one, uh, this is a, uh, a phrase that wasn't used for sabbaticals. It's from Peter Kreft actually talking about something else, but stranger enemy friend. And what that means is, is it's a stranger at first, man, I'd sure like to get some time off. I really, wouldn't that be great to just get away then it becomes an enemy when you get it. You're like, man, I am bored. I got to do something. Give me my phone. And we can feel that with our phones a lot of times. It's like, man, wouldn't it be great to not mess with my phone? So we throw it to the side. And then about five minutes later, you, you grab your phone again because now it's an enemy. You, But there's something great on the other side of bored. There's something great on the other side of rest that's a deeper thing that very few people get to. So stranger, enemy, friend. Then you realize, oh, man why I've been, been going so fast. This is a friend. This is a good friend to be able to, to see days in chunks, not in hours. And I think, I think those things are, are really good. And then I tell our church all the time, because pastors wonder, well, how do I get my church to let me do this? Is um, you can have me 40 weeks a year fired up or 50 week, 52 weeks a year mediocre. So which, which would you rather? I, I can give you 52 weeks of solid mediocre or I can give you 40 weeks of fired up and they go fired up. And then you put a plan together, you know, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to do it. Here's how much money it's going to cost. Here's how I'm going to fill the pulpit. Here's what's going to take place and show that it's not just this glorified vacation and to be able to then leave the cupboard, you know, don't leave it bare, let it be some good speakers and such, and then let, let God do his work through you. And it'll be an example to the church. You know, we have chaotic churches, so we have chaotic pastors. And now I can be an example to the church, you know, of what it looks like to rest. So one other thing, too, we always go to other churches, you know, on sabbatical. So we're because otherwise we're always at our church, which is great. We love our church, but it's great to actually be a guest at another church, you know, and feel what so many people feel right walking into a church for the first time and not knowing anyone. And it's just good to be, you know, kind of have understand that perspective a little more. And I feel like we come back always so grateful for um, the church that God has called us to and a a, a fresh appreciation for the people and the guests that come and just, and just, you know, um, being able to reach out to people more and understanding, having seen it from a visitor's eyes. So it's just good to get out of our own context, honestly, and, and then be able to come back and, and put those things into practice. So get some new ideas. Yeah. Totally. You know, yeah, totally. So I'm wondering how, so people are listening and they're thinking, we don't have that. That's not ingrained in the DNA of our church. How do we begin talking about that with our church and making that something that is available to our pastors? I would say, ask a couple churches what they do that, you know, have this, what's their sabbatical policy, get it on a piece of paper, get them to send it to you. And then um, begin to kind of think it through and then sit down with whatever the governance structure is, you know, with a man of peace within that structure, a person of peace and say, hey, I've been thinking, what do you think about if I was to take four weeks, you know, to whatever you want to shoot for? And I was to get away. And what you'll find is they'll be very supportive. I hope you'll find that they'll be very supportive. And then also, too, here's the thing. (laughs) 
none of your church members are there four weeks in a row very much anyway. You know, I mean, everybody's doing stuff. So, you, you know, you being gone for four weeks, you're going to, they're going to miss you too and bring in somebody that's, that's a good speaker and they'll be just fine. It'll be fine. And you got a good step and, and let it, let it be. So do a little research, let it be more of, instead of a, you know, kind of a car crash, I have to go right now because if not, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, uh, quit the ministry instead say, you know, what if next summer, what if next, whatever season is best, uh, we were to able to do this and start thinking that through and let it just be a small kind of frog in the kettle type of thing. And then we found great value in the church being involved. So like our prayer teams at the church wrote us prayer cards and every day we would open up a different prayer card from a different person and they would be, we're praying for you. We love you and all that. And so it made them like, who wants to be the one that writes a prayer card? I think you ought to be at the office right now. You should be checking email. What are you doing? Spending time reading your Bible. I mean, nobody's going to do that. Right. I mean, right. at least some kind of social skill. So it puts them, uh, you know, in the mix of, of now we're a part of it. So, so I, I, that, that's how, you know, that's how I'd encourage it. So good. The way that y'all communicate things is so good. Greg, hearing from you as a college student, I mean, you know, I could just, you, the way you say things is, is just, God has gifted you with that. But the same for you, Kelly, the things that you're saying, we can just grab onto and go, yes, yes, that makes sense. So thank you for that. And I just want to close with hearing Greg, I know you are, write books and you've had a book recently. Has it already come out? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's- um, which is great. And then one other, let me add one thing on the sabbatical thing. Uh, you know, people say, well, what's the difference? Why should a minister get this when other people don't get this? Yes. Well, not every vocation has the emotional spiritual drain that it does. Now, I think being the manager of, you know, a, a supermarket or president of a bank is very draining, no question. But they're not dealing with emotions and spiritual stuff at the same level you know, it's mental and physical. So that's a little bit of a separation, which, you know, uh, mentioned that I just want to add. Um, the book that you mentioned, uh, this is really exciting. I've always wanted to have a 365 day devotional. I've written other books and, um, but to have a 365 day devotional. So it's called Capture the Moment and produced by um, Broadman Holman. And uh, so what's two things that are really neat about it. One, um, all of the author's royalties are going to send relief to be able to help people in disaster relief situations. So it's providing every devotional sold. I don't get a penny. Um, it's cost me money and time, you know, but gladly so. Uh, is uh, Don't receive one bit of royalties. It goes out. And so every book feeds three meals. So right now at this point, we think that over 30,000 meals um, have been, been given out basically uh, to people in disaster relief situations. That's amazing. Yeah, isn't that cool? So we're very fired up about it. Now, here's what's one last thing that's pretty cool. Our church for 30 plus years has chosen a church-wide devotional every year. So every year for 30 years, we'll pick a devotional and we go through it as a church together. And so this devotional we're going through as a church, obviously, you know, they, they think that's cool for their pastor to go through the devotional with that. So that's been great. So churches have been doing it as a church-wide devotional. So then the pastor stands up on Sunday and goes, man, did y'all read the devotional on Friday? It's exactly what my message was about, you know, and God starts using that. And then the church is also missional where say a church of 500 buys, you know, 500 of these. Well, they just provided 1500 meals to people in disaster relief. So it's called capture the moment. Um, super excited about it. God's really using it. Um, and it's, it's been great. It's a little, little devotional guy, 365, um, but it's, it's been, been a real blessing. That's great. Well, I'll put a link to that in the show notes for people. Maybe they could share it with their churches too. I love that, that y'all are using it for sin relief. Thank y'all team Mott for joining me today on by faith. I just love y'all and I love getting to talk with you and I'm glad I get to share you with people who listen to my podcast. Yes. Thanks Christine. Well, we, we've known you a long time and you and your wonderful husband, Kyle, and you guys have been godly, amazing people since college and to see y'all get married and kids and church and just all the things that y'all have done. So we're so proud of y'all and so excited about what God has already done and what he's going to do in the future. And just, man, it's just great stuff.
Thanks so much for listening to the Ministry Wives podcast, a production of the North American Mission Board. If you found this content helpful, please subscribe, rate, and review us on your podcast platform or share it with a friend. You can find this podcast and other helpful resources at ministrywivespodcast.com.